this just seems silly. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. I don't know what time it is as you're listening, but you're listening to Crucial Conversations, and I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And welcome back from our Christmas break. I actually had a nice vacation. Kevin, once again, left the country to avoid being near me and to avoid podcasting. I did. Yeah, I I simply went to another part of the country. I didn't leave it entirely. Well, there you go. Yeah. But anyways, do do we want to... Okay, um, I just lost my train of thought seems kind of silly to fill people in on our Christmas plans. That's let's not do that. Yeah. That's not really a thing that we do on this podcast. Is it? I just say something weird and silly maybe. And then we start, right? I think you've done that. Let's start. Great. So today we're going to talk about the Gainus myostaticum, which I could totally say easier than the Gainus apotelis modicum, which I can now finally say it took that me, cool? what, two episodes to be able to say that one. <laughs> But this is the third Gainus, which is part of our Christology 101 series. So we're actually talking about the two natures in Christ, how those two natures relate to each other. Um, I just stepped in heresy again, didn't I? Well, you're getting there. Uh, yeah, I was really close. That's that's the problem. That, that's why we're having this conversation. Um, which the fact that I did that should give people hope that if you've you've been with us this far, and I'm still messing it up and I'm supposed to be like the host who knows something about this and I'm still messing it up. If you're not getting it, that's okay. <laughs> um, all right. So Kevin, introduce us to the Gainus Myostaticum. Well, again, like all good friends, it helps if you know our other friends. So the Gainus Myostaticum is the way we're numbering it. We're in line with Chemnitz's numbering of the whole system. This is the third of the three Gainuses or genera that we're talking about. So the first two are the Gainus idiomaticum and the Gainus apotelismaticum. And what those those two talk about is how the two natures of Christ operate in the person of Christ. In two so, natures in Christ. In Christ operate in Christ, right? (laughs) Yeah. So what we want to talk about in those two is the fact that there's one person of Jesus, the Christ, and in that one person are two natures, the human nature and the divine nature. And in the Gainus Idiomaticum, it talks about the scriptural confession that Jesus does whatever he does according to his natures. So we will see one of the natures active in everything Jesus does. We don't combine the natures and we don't separate the natures, but we identify whatever he does according to the characteristic of the nature that we see. So according to the Gainus Idiomaticum, we will say Jesus was hungry according to his human nature. Jesus conquered death in the grave according to his divine nature. Can can we say which person contributes that attribute or, or which nature contributes that attribute to the person? Right. So when we say according to, we're saying that's the nature that is at work in the person of Jesus mm-hmm. doing that or that we see at work. Right. Now, remember. That leads us to the next one, which is the, the Gainus Apotelismaticum. The Gainus Apotelismaticum is the Gainus that teaches us that everything the person of Jesus does, both natures contribute to, or both natures are active. So yeah, it's Jesus not is one or the other, where he's right. like skipping back and forth between them. Exactly. So you don't just have the human Jesus doing certain things and the divine Jesus doing certain other things. You don't have that. Right. Uh, What we confess is that both natures are active in all the actions of Jesus, even though we see one over the other more prominently, right? But both natures are active and that all of that activity is for for the accomplishment of our salvation. I just had a a weird image of like 
the person of Jesus splitting into two individuals and the divine nature ran off to heal somebody while his human nature went to take a nap. Yeah. And you see, you can't do that. I think that. that's wrong. <laughs> that's, so that's, that's the error of Nestorianism where you can okay. actually pull apart the two natures and separate them. We don't want to do that. They are, they are in the one person, Jesus, and that one person, Jesus, has two natures. You don't separate the natures, but you also don't confuse the natures. So, again, the Gainus Ap- Apotelismaticum tells us that all the actions that the person of Jesus does, everything he does, he does with both natures. They both contribute to it. They're both active in it. And all those actions are for our salvation. Yep. Okay. Now that leads to the last one we're going to talk about. And the reason we've done it in this order is because this one is entirely different. Yeah. This one throws us a huge curveball, Right. Because we're, <laughs> we're changing what we're saying and how we're saying it. Well, we're going to, we're going to use the same phrase, but it's actually going to mean something different now. It's going to be the opposite. Almost. Yeah. Which is confusing. Which is very confusing. <laughs> I'm reading through this. I'm like, what? I'm really glad I'm doing show prep on this one and I have time to like actually read through this because right. I would have very, walked into this like, wait, what? Very weird. Yeah. Um, so what the Gainus Majesticum, and again, that's the Latin word for basically majest or majesty or majestic. Yeah. Okay. So think Majesticum, just put a J where the I is and you have majestic, right? So it's the majestic Gainus. And that's important because... This is not talking about which nature contributes what to the person. This is talking about how the two natures interact with each other. Do you see the difference? Yeah. Yeah. So the first two Gainuses, idiomaticum and apotelismaticum are talking about how the two natures interact in the person of Jesus. This is actually the, the Gainus that talks about how the two natures interact with each other. And what we're going to learn in this one is when we say according to in the Gainus Myostaticum, it actually means the Gainus that receives the attribute. Yeah, as opposed to the one contributing right. that attribute to the action or to the person. Exactly. So the idiomaticum, it's the it's the nature that we see contributing that to the person of Christ. He's hungry according to his human nature. And the Gainus myostaticum, according to means the nature that receives the attribute. Which, okay, so initially this is confusing because we're changing terminology. But when it comes down to it, it's actually quite simple because there's only one nature that actually receives anything. Right. So now And the other is, nature receives nothing. So it's well, like, so, all right. No, now you're skipping ahead to the end. So, I know, but it's like, cool, I'm figuring it out. I'm exactly. excited. <laughs> so what happens is when we talk about the Gainus Myostaticum, this is really the simple confession. And we're not going to make it too hard. It's really simple. The human nature of Jesus, the human person of Jesus, receives from his divine nature, divine attributes okay mm-hmm. yeah that's it that's right. all we're gonna say so <laughs> we're, we're waiting for the and that's it in this one there is no and right so the human nature of christ receives divine whatever you want to say there when you say when you describe divinity that's a sign to the person of jesus and that's the confession of the Gainus Myostaticum. Okay. Mm-hmm. So what we have, let's just let's just do a Bible verse we all know by memory. John 1 14. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. And dwelt among us. And we have seen seen his glory. Yeah. The glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, how can you see the glory of God in a person? That's the Gainus Myostaticum. That the the divine glory is in the person of Christ as the communication of the divine nature to the human nature. So the human yeah, the human nature has received that glory and we can see it. 
Right. So, so it? according to the human nature, right, he has the divine glory. Yeah, that's where it's going to get confusing because we've been using this phrase so consistently and now we're messing it up. <laughs> and and but we're not. But so it's just it's just one of those things you just kind of go slowly. Yep. Find yeah. a buddy, hold hands, <laughs> and you'll be fine. Well, I know some of the listeners that, that listen to our podcast, one of them is a couple and they and they listen to us like on their Sunday drive to church. So they actually can hold hands Good. during this. Yes. So fine. you guys, you know who you are. Hold hands for this part, all right? Find your Christology buddy. Hold hands. We're going to be fine. Right. So, so all this is really saying, and, and we'll get to this in a, as we go, is that Your when we, to hurt, when we talk about Jesus being eternal or Jesus being omnipresent or Jesus being omniscient or Jesus being omnipotent the human nature is receiving those qualities from the divine nature right that's the gainus myostaticum now we're not done yet okay we've got to confess one more part of this is that this is not seen until the exaltation of christ uh, the exaltation being after the okay. resurrection. Now, this means we have to go back and review our states of Christ. Ooh. Remember, Jesus exists in two different states. Kansas and... No, I'm just kidding. Wait, two that's, that states. can't be right. Yeah, that's, that all, the be right. all the Texas people are like, that's not that's Kansas. Not Texas. Okay, <laughs> so he exists in two states... The state of humiliation and the state of exaltation. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Remember, the state of humiliation is defined as Jesus voluntarily refraining from the full use of the divine nature. Right. Jesus voluntarily refraining from from the full use of the divine nature. Notice this is what we talked about last in our last episode about him setting aside or emptying himself. Exactly. So yeah. he he doesn't get rid of it. He voluntarily refrains from the full use of it. Right. Yeah. So Jesus says things like, I don't know the day when I'm coming back. Only the father knows that. So he doesn't know something. Well, how can the omniscient God who knows everything, not know something. Well, that's Jesus voluntarily not using the full extent of his divine nature. Right? Right. So in the state of humiliation, you do not see the gain is my And, and the, the most important teaching on this, remember is now again, hold on. Find your buddy, <laughs> hold hands. We'll get through this together. It's the locative nature of his corporal being. Oh, that more brain hurting. Yes. That's why you're holding hands with your buddy <laughs> yeah. at this point. I don't have a buddy, Kevin. We're okay. actually not in the same room again. We're separated so, by a river. Which is why I'm free to talk about holding hands because we can't do that. That's, that's a good so, point. So here's the thing. We we're talking about the locative nature of Jesus' corporal being. Now, that's not as hard as you think. Locative where, is where simply, is he? Yes. Where yeah. is Jesus physically? Yeah. Not where is he spiritually or where is he in our minds or in our hearts? Where is Jesus physically? Now, you know, it, it's nice that for at least that phrase, there's, yeah. there's normal words for there's, it as opposed to our three genera that have that no normal really words have to, to go them. with them. So so, so <laughs> we're talking about the locative existence of the corporal essence of Christ, right? Right. And so, as you would say, where is he? Physically. Yep. And, and in the state of humiliation, he is one place at one time. Yeah, Jesus is not actually omnipresent. Well... During, in his state of humiliation. In the state of humiliation, he's voluntarily refraining from the full use of divine nature. So he is yeah. located one place at one time. Now, what that means is you can read this in the Bible. 
that people as had to follow fact, him around. <laughs> as a matter of fact, this is the reason for John chapter four. Ooh. As he's going from Jerusalem to Galilee, he must pass through Samaria. Why? Because he's walking. He's not <laughs> divinely shooting around. Right? Yep. Yep. Now, 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 let's not freak out. And there, crowds can follow him. There so is, they can see him walking. There is divine transportation in the New Testament. Ooh, yeah. Okay. Do you guys know uh, who? It's in the uh, book of Acts. Where Philip. Oh, Philip. Yes. Philip, right at the beginning. The Holy Spirit actually picks him up and carries him around. It's the weirdest thing. I got sidetracked because I've been listening to Whedon and he's in John eight. I'm behind. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, and and Jesus kind of disappears. So I got sidetracked by the invisibility and you were talking about teleportation. Yeah. He actually, and I was saying, I was thinking about invisibility. So, so it's a different superpower. <laughs> totally different. But again, that's explicitly by the power of the Holy spirit. So, when Jesus is on the earth in the state of humiliation, voluntarily refraining from the full use of his divine nature, he is located one place at one time. Mm-hmm. When he's in Galilee, he's not in Jerusalem. When right. he's in Samaria, he's not in Galilee. This when seems like an obvious water, point to make. <laughs> it, it, it kind of does, but it kind of is important. Right. It's like we're clearly going somewhere with this. So in John chapter 6... Now, now, just think this, just just believe me for a second. Okay. In John chapter 6, after the walking on the water, we have one of the weirdest paragraphs in scripture because it makes almost no sense. And I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to summarize it. It says this. So the crowd who were, who were the ones who were the feeding the 5,000 crowd, they kind of go to the place where the boats were, where Jesus' disciples got in to cross the sea. But they realize that Jesus did not get in the boat with his disciples, and there's only one boat that left. But the people who came from Tiberias across the sea say Jesus is over there, but they know that Jesus didn't get in the boat over here to get over there. So the people over there have come over here and said he's not here, he's over there. And the people on the shore over here travel over there to see Jesus because they can't figure out how Jesus got there. (laughs) Now, the reason that's important is because Jesus is located one place at one time. Hmm. That's why that's important. So in the state of humiliation, Jesus is locally present. He's physically one place at one time. So he's he's locally present in a corporal sense. So what we learn from this passage and others like it is that, and again, it's simple as Peter said, Jesus, when he's in his earthly ministry in the state of humiliation is only one place at a time physically, right? Mm -hmm. He's not hanging out in America while he's in Israel. Oh, wait, wait, but Oh no, the Mormons have not done that after the resurrection. So we're okay there. Okay. Right. So just kidding. (laughs) But the, the resurrection is important because Christ then after his death and resurrection, is in the state of exaltation. Now, let's review. If the state of humiliation was his voluntary restraint from the full use of his divine nature, the exaltation is the full use and display of his divine nature. Mm -hmm. So what that means is, now that Christ is in the state of exaltation, according to the Gainus Maestaticum, Jesus is physically omnipresent. Okay, so we actually had a question about this back when we first started this series. Um, a listener wanted to know, when does the state of humiliation start and end, and when does the state of exaltation begin? Because as we're talking through this, I'm thinking, well, there's the resurrection. The time from the resurrection to the ascension, see, he's doing some pretty amazing divine things, but he's still not really omnipresent as it, far as scripture says. Are you sure? 
No, I'm not. I'm trying to think. It's like I don't I don't know if any of those scripture accounts are supposed to be happening at the same time, are they? He's able to walk through locked doors in John well, yeah. chapter twenty, which but he is could impressive. also walk but he could walk on water too. So it's like I could still put that one in that same category. Yeah, not really. <laughs> no, okay, why not? Because he didn't have a resurrected flesh. Okay. So Traditionally, you want to think of the the incarnation being the beginning of the state of humiliation, not that incarnation is humiliation, but the state of humiliation begins with the incarnation. Okay. Okay. And then the, the state of exaltation begins with the descent into hell. Okay. So he goes to hell to proclaim victory as the exalted Christ. So everything after that, the resurrection, the 40 days teaching, the ascension, his sitting at the right hand of the father, his return in glory, his judgment, that's all the state of exaltation. Okay, I've never thought about this before because I've never thought through the state of exaltation. But do we have any indication in those accounts that he's omnipresent doing any of those things at the same time as he's doing the other things? Not explicitly, but there are some who would read the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus and say, if we put them all together, he is actually more than one place at a time, or he is traveling so fast that it would be instantaneous travel. He's doing like the teleportation or yeah. something. So okay. there, there's something different about the post-resurrection appearances than there are about the narratives of the Gospels. Now, we're not going to press that too far because Scripture doesn't press that too far. Right. So we're just going to let it be. And but this but is, it, what, where it's helpful is in, if people are saying, well, there's contradictions in Scripture and it doesn't make sense. It's like, eh, okay, yeah, it might not make sense according to our human reason. But if he's now got – he's in the state of exaltation – it's possible. Right. Oh, it's, so. it's entirely possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so it's helpful in that sense, at least. But but this actually brings up a very important point, and I'm, I know you read this as you were preparing for the show. Um, you will often read in the Lutheran dogmaticians, which is a fancy word for guys who write theology, um, that especially in the Gainus Maestaticum, the caution that we will not say more than scripture says. Yeah. Yep. You know, it'd be like, well, you know, we're tempted to answer this question or this charge or answer this challenge by doing this, but we can't because scripture doesn't go there. So we aren't either. Well, and we've even talked about that on this podcast right. multiple times. We, Our goal is to say what scripture says and not more and not less. Yeah. And and even the Gainus Maestaticum is the church's effort to confess what scripture says and no more. It's to simply say, this is what scripture teaches, and this is the best way for us to talk about it. Yeah, it's it's not quite a how does this work, but it has some if you take it too far, you almost try and do that. And remember, as <laughs> as we go through this Christological discussion, which hopefully we will have the rest of our lives, you're always tempted to say, therefore, it only makes sense that. Mm. And that's usually where you're going to go wrong. What you want to say is, I'm saying this because scripture teaches me to say it. Right. right. I'm yep. saying this because scripture says that in order to live, you must eat the body of Christ. You say, whoa, how does flesh give eternal life? <laughs> well, here we go. Right. Yep. Yep. Um, John 5, 27, the son of man, that's definitely referring to Christ as human, has received authority to execute divine judgment. So. How does that happen? Well, that's what drives us to confess things like the Gainus Maestaticum. So you, you really are driven by the desire to confess what scripture teaches us to confess. And what we want to talk about then in the guy Gainus Maestaticum, and, and this is the essential um, doctrinal, practical 
application of this teaching for Lutherans is the real presence of the Lord's Supper, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, this this is where it co- where the rubber hits the road when we talk about the real presence, and we're like, well, okay, how does that work? How is that possible? Well, it's, that's, how is the wrong question? And pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's really it's like you said. What does Scripture say about this? And the Gainus Myostaticum is kind of our taking our human words to say what Scripture says. Okay, and apparently we have to use Latin. To yeah, do we gotta that. use Latin to do that because it's, <laughs> it's holier. Those are better human words than any other. They're older, except for so, German. So, uh, let's see. How do we go about this? <laughs> so the ch- let's just be totally blunt, right? That's the easiest way to do theology: is tell the truth, right? So here's the thing: all the Protestant churches and even the Catholic Church really confess. The first two gainuses, you know, you know gainus idiomaticum and apotels maticum, they have some differences here and there, but basically they're cool with it. Yeah. This is the one where people go, all right, you Lutherans are just inventing a gainus to defend your doctrine of the real presence. That's all you're doing. Right. This is quite convenient that one of your Christological descriptions is also the slam dunk proof for the, the real presence of the Lord's <laughs> Supper. Which is actually why we started talking about this gainus and not about the Lord's Supper right off the bat. Right. And <laughs> and I just want people to be aware of this. Yeah. That the Lutheran response to that is, and, and this is important, so you can grab the hand of your Christological buddy because this will be a time for you to celebrate being a Lutheran. <laughs> we look at them and we say, thanks for playing, but the doctrine of the real presence is not derived from the Gainus Maestaticum. Mm. The Lutheran doctrine of the real presence is derived from the words of Jesus himself. And the Gainus Maestaticum is our attempt to describe that. Actually, no. No, the Gainus Maestaticum comes from other words of Scripture and lines up perfectly with what Jesus said in the Lord's Supper. See, we actually don't defend doctrine from our confession of other doctrines. Okay, wait, say that again. We don't defend doctrine from our confession of other doctrines. That seems like a really important thought because (laughs) we believe in sola. Scriptura. Scriptura. Doctrine Uh, doesn't interpret scripture. Yeah. Scripture. So we're not going to build one doctrine upon the other as if one doctrine is the foundation of the other doctrine. We don't, we don't build a tower like that. That's called scholasticism. You don't do that. So what we say, they say, well, this is quite convenient. You've got this gainus myostaticum that also is perfectly in line with the Lord's Supper. And we go, yeah, God does that sometimes. <laughs> and they say, what do you mean? We say, well, here's the thing. The doctrine of the real presence of the Lord's Supper is very simple. Jesus said, this is my body. And we went, kind of sounds like you mean that. And then Paul, yeah. Paul says, when you receive the bread, you receive the body of Christ, you receive the cup of, of salvation, you receive the blood of Christ. We go, kind of seems like Paul believes in the real presence. Kind of seems like Jesus said the real presence. Kind of seems like we should believe it too. So when Jesus says, take ye, this is my body, we say, okay. Okay, yeah. We will believe you that it is exactly what you said it is. You notice we didn't have to invoke the Gainus Myostaticum. <laughs> we simply listen yeah, to the words this, of Jesus. And if our listeners have never even heard of the Gainus Maestaticum, they're still Christians. Right. It's amazing. And the Lord is still present in his supper. Yep. Yep. And, and so this is actually extremely important for us is that we say, you're right. This is an excellent dogmatic defense of how Jesus could be present on every altar at the same time. But this is not the fundamental reason we confess the Lord's Supper as the real presence of Christ. We confess the real presence of Christ in the Lord's Supper because of the words of Jesus. Yeah. That's the same reason we confess baptismal regeneration. Right? Mm -hmm. Because Jesus taught us to believe that. 
Right. Because scripture confesses that doctrine. This, this is how scripture speaks. And so we're going to speak that way as well. Now, the cool thing is the same scripture teaches us the gainus myostaticum. <laughs> and we say, oh, maybe there's something here that helps us understand that in the state of exaltation, the promises that Jesus gave to his church to be with them always, to be present in his supper, to be present in his word, right? All these promises he keeps and they're not symbolic. They're not some kind of metaphorical promise. Now think this through for a second. The or resurrection only symbolic or, or only, only symbolic, right? Yeah, they are. Obviously they are metaphorical, but and symbolic and symbolic, but not only <laughs> right. But they're, <laughs> yeah. but he's actually present. And this is what I want you to think about too. On the third day, when Jesus rose, was that a spiritual resurrection? Was that a physical resurrection? A physical, he had a body. Exactly. How do we know that? Uh, that's what scripture says. Right. Oh, because, Thomas. Because touched. the scriptures tell us explicitly he has a body. Yeah, Both, he's eating fish. Right. Gospel of Luke, he's eating stuff. He actually says, uh, ghosts don't eat. This was pre-Ghostbusters, yeah. <laughs> of course. But, Slimer was not yet yeah. around. Well, yeah. well, I think the people who wrote that had read, you know, and they're like, ah, ghosts do eat. And, you know. <laughs> but that didn't work out. What at all. does Jesus know? We're going to make a movie yeah. that confesses this better. Right. Introduce Slimer. Wait a but, minute. But Jesus actually addresses this. He says, look, I've got a body. I'm not some kind of aberration. I'm not some kind of phantom. I, it's me. It's the you, guy that you know that you hung out with. You can touch with. my hands. Right. You can see the holes in them. You can touch my side. Go there ahead. It it's me. Yep. It's me. So when we confess the actual physical resurrection of Jesus, now we have a physical Jesus that will physically return. What is he doing between now and then? Well, here's the thing that Jesus said, whenever you do this, you do it in remembrance of me and I will be there to forgive your sins. That's his mm -hmm. promise with the Lord's supper. He makes promises of being physically present. So we say, now we understand in the state of exaltation that the human nature of Christ receives the qualities of the divine nature. So the human person of Jesus has in the state of exaltation, the divine qualities. He is omnipresent. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent, right? Mm-hmm. He even has the qualities we don't see. Uh, you lost me there. Yeah, this is another important condition. They're like, <laughs> they're like, well, that's nice. You want to assign to Jesus all the qualities that work out well for your doctrine, but what about all the other qualities of, of God? And we actually say all the qualities of the divine nature are given to the human nature, even if we don't see them, even if we don't see them displayed. Okay. Now, you mentioned it earlier, and we've got to address it now. Does this mean that the human qualities are given to the divine nature? Right. No. No. That, that it doesn't work that way. It can't work that way. So this, it. I don't remember if it is. I don't think it's one of the creeds, but one of the ways in which we talk about how that happened is we talk about the div divinity assuming the humanity, like the humanity was s not subsumed, but assumed into the divinity as opposed to the divinity being stuck into the humanity. That's the Am Athanasian that right? creed. That's the Athanasian oh. creed. Okay. I knew it's like, there's, we've done this somehow. And that, that matters because yes. of this. Exactly. Well, it or all this matters, matters because this matters because of that. Yeah. Right. right. <laughs> But it's like those. That's the. That's the. That's where we get this, is from that creed. Well, you can say it that way. It's all confessing the same thing, correct? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's all confessing the same Christology. So, now remember, 
when you're doing Christology, the question is, why are we doing Christology? Why all these Latin terms? Why all this being very particular about our language and making sure we don't say something false? What's the point? Who cares? The reason this matters is because the goal of Christology is a confession that brings comfort to sinners. Mm -hmm. This is God for you. This is God for you in his word. This is God for you in your baptism. This is God for you in the supper. This well, is then, God for you in Jesus Christ in all the ways he's promises. And, and this is God promising to physically return and reign as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Your savior is not weak. He is not defeated. He is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and God of God. This is why I've had my Bible open to Matthew 26 for this whole episode so far, because the, the institution of the Lord's Supper there, and it's that phrase uh, in verse 28, for, the, for, for many, for forgiveness of sins. This matters because it's about forgiveness of sins. If, if you don't have this, you don't have forgiveness of sins. Can I say it that way? Sure. If, if Jesus, you lose this, you lose forgiveness of sins. That's what we're giving up. If Jesus doesn't mean what he says, then you don't know if you are saved. Yeah. And this is the point is that we believe exactly what Jesus says because of who he is. If I say, Peter, here's the thing. Just stick with me, kid. And I will save you for all of eternity. And you say, <laughs> well, that sounds great. What qualification do you have to make that claim? And I go, well, yeah, tell me how that's going to work out, Kevin. You know, I got a PhD from Cordes Seminary, St. Louis. And you go, well, that's great. But I don't think eternally that's actually going to help me much. And, and I could go do that, too. It'd be a lot of work, but right. I could also go do that. And you kind of go, that's great, but no thanks. But Jesus <laughs> walks up and they say, what, what right do you have to say this? And he goes, well, I am the son of God. Hmm. I am Yahweh in the flesh. Right? Remember mm -hmm. the guy who talked to Moses on the mountain? Yeah, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. And, the, and they say, <laughs> you're claiming to be God. And he says, well, okay, now you're starting to catch on. Very good. <laughs> right? So this is the point. They say, you're not God. We'll prove it. We will kill you. And he says, I get that. And you are going to kill me. But listen to this. No one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own Willingly. accord. Yep. And if I have the authority to lay it down, I also have the authority to take it up again. And so when he rises from the dead and stands as the crucified and risen Lord, the apostle Thomas falls down and worships him with the words of the Old Testament confession of Yahweh and says, my Lord and my God. Mm. And Jesus said, blessed are those. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe what Thomas just confessed. And that's, that's an important confession. I, I think if you don't, no, and I didn't know until you taught me this, that that was the Old Testament confession. It just seems like Thomas is like, okay, yeah, you're the real deal. Right. But it's like, no, this this is more than just you're my friend who died and now rose from the dead. That confession is, it's much deeper than just, oh yeah, you are that guy that I've been hanging out with the last three years. This is the confession of the only God, hmm. the one true God. And he's saying it to Jesus and he's saying it correctly to Jesus, which yeah. means, which means for every single person listening to this podcast, including the two people doing this podcast yep. <laughs> is that salvation is found in no one else. There is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That name is Jesus. It was put upon you in your baptism. 
You will receive it when you walk into church in the invocation. You receive it in the benediction. You receive it in his word. You receive it in the sacrament. It's Christ for you, forgiveness of sins, eternal life. Promise made, promise kept. Hmm. And that is the crucial conversation. Next week, Kevin, are we going to do that episode of answering people's questions? We got several that we can address now. Let's we've do got it. The three genera. So next week, and if you have questions about this episode or any previous ones, send them to us. Questions at crucialproductions.org is the email address, or you can go to our website, crucialproductions.org. There's a link at the top that says, ask a question, fill out the form, submit that. Um, we want to hear from you. If you got feedback on our series so far, um, now we've, we've gone through the three genera. There's many other things we will talk about in Christology 101, but if you have um, particular topics you want us to address, send those in too. We'd love to hear from you on that. So, Kevin, any uh, other things you want to add to that? Just keep reading scripture. Keep going to church. Um, the most important thing when you think about Christology is to not get caught up in the academic side of things, but always to simply confess what scripture teaches you to confess about Christ. Amen. We'll see you guys next time. Thanks.